you. It's wonderful to be here today. Technology has transformed social movements in three important ways. It has amplified people's voices. Some are being heard for the first time. Second, borders don't matter. They are no longer obstacles to change. Third, it's information and access to it that matters. But first, I want to talk to you about how, when I was growing up, I wanted to change the world. My father wanted me to go into technology as a career, but I rejected that for a long time. I thought, I'm not going to change the world with computers. I wanted to be a human rights lawyer and, and work at the UN and change the world. And so I went to university and studied international affairs and, and economics, politics. And when I graduated after four long years, the only job I was able to get at the UN was in the mailroom. And that wasn't going to do it for me, especially as today mailrooms are kind of being defunct given the internet. So I knew that people, even the most action-oriented people, can get paralyzed by the enormity of problems. And I didn't want that to happen to me. I wanted to take action and make a change, make a difference for people's lives. And I also knew that I learned really quickly that maybe if change doesn't just come from these powerful institutions and strong leaders, it can come from the bottom up, from people like me. And now I'm convinced that technology is a means to do so. And no, it's not a magic bullet that if you get the internet, it change, you know, makes you want to change the world and, and is a flipping the change switch that everybody is going to be better. It's not. The internet is just a communication tool like others that came before it. Like the telephone, the printing press. But what's so powerful is the access to information and the tools are transforming how we organize globally. Let me take you through the three that I think are important. The first is the internet has amplified voices. Some are being heard for the first time. Especially in this region, the recent uprisings aren't because of Facebook and Twitter, as Sam said earlier. They're actually because of decades of social, political, and economic discontent. Regimes that lasted decades have fallen in days, and others are being forced to listen to voices that were silenced and ignored for too long. The internet has provided a catalyst that was critical for people to openly express their ideas and their discontents. A lot of this would have only been shared with their most immediate families or friends before the internet. Another example of this is in West Africa, corruption has been complained about and known for a long time, but now there are tools that are so amazing to get information out to everyone. Here is an example of truck drivers who face obstacles when delivering goods across borders. And they're actually now SMSing in the bribes that they have to pay, the delays at checkpoints. This kind of information is bound to bring change to the region. And so people are using all kinds of platforms to be able to communicate to the world. And our voices are being heard and amplified. The second, borders don't matter. Now, I know this is very difficult to say here in Palestine. But I believe even here the changes have come about. The barriers to change, like your geographic location, your nationality, your social background, your ethnicity, all of these are diminishing in importance as people are starting to communicate on issues and communicate outside of their region and outside of their cause. And not only can you impact change within your community, but you can do it in remote communities around the world. There's a recent poll that came out where the majorities in 42 nations out of 45 recognize themselves as citizens of the world. And in China, 50% of the respondents 
recognize themselves primarily as world citizens. There's an incredible global empathy that is reducing almost the need for a state. Messages are global. And sometimes this is the most critical thing to actually garner international support for your cause to make it successful. These messages here are in English to communicate outside of the region and outside of their cause. But with the tools, that the technology today, translation is becoming so sophisticated that I think even language is reducing as a barrier for change. I believe the new language is hashtags. And for those of you who don't know, which I'm sure the majority of you now know, it's the number sign or the hash sign in front of a keyword. And that keyword is not only used for search, but it actually links discussions and conversations together across multiple platforms. And for example, in Mexico in 2009, the government tried to levy a 3% internet tax for access. And there was a, a blogger who was upset with this and criticized the government and wrote an article with the internet hashtag, hash internet necessario. This was picked up around the world, and the next day was a global trending topic on Twitter. And they protested on all kinds of platforms and in the streets with this hashtag. So much so that the government had to abandon the law. These movements are also organizing themselves and sharing best practice. Here is an example of movements.org which is an alliance of youth movements where digital activists get together and actually share best practices on how to leverage the tools to make their movement successful. They do this through annual meetings, through online discussions, through training sessions. Borders are falling, and what prohibited us before is no longer there. We have the tools for global organization. Access to information is the third key component. And we all know this. We all know how important this is. But let me just take you through some examples that might shock you. Did you know that there are 10 petabytes of information being created online every single day? That is more than eight times the amount of information that is in all the libraries in the United States. That kind of information is bound to disrupt everything. For example, some say that the recent Bahrain uprising were fueled by a map that was created. This map showed or claimed that 95% of the land is owned by the royal family. This is another map that was created after WikiLeaks released 390,000 Iraqi war records. The Guardian newspaper decided to take the last five years of information and put it on a map of all of the Iraqi casualties. This is only the map of what is in and around Baghdad. Each red dot represents an Iraqi casualty. Google aggregates data for flu trends. and When you're searching online for flu <coughs> symptoms or for flu or for remedies, we actually aggregate that data and map it for you to have information that we can actually d predict two weeks before a flu outbreak. This is powerful information, not only for medical relief workers to organize and mobilize resources to the right location, but actually for you to protect yourself before you ever need a doctor. We saw all three of these come together in Tahir Square, where bloggers set up a network in the square and live stream data to the world. And even when the internet was shut down, they found ways to leverage tools like Speak to Tweet to get the information out there and get us in on the movement. I was in Gaza two days ago. This is graffiti on the wall just outside of the ministry buildings that were bombed in 2009. 
The message in the middle resonates so loudly with me. It says, only I can change my life. No one can do it for me. Movements today are leaderless because everyone is a leader. You don't need permission. Well before Wai al Khunim in Egypt, in 2008, 12 million people marched around the world against the FARC. This was the first time that the government actually realized that the FARC didn't have the people on their side and were able to act against them. The US government sent down a representative to Bogota, Colombia, to see who led this great movement. And they found no one. But there was a Facebook page. It was called A Million Voices Against the FARC, started by a young engineer in Barranquilla, Colombia, named Oscar Morales. He didn't consider himself a leader. He was just fed up and compelled to tell people. Today, I spend my time developing technology in Palestine. I do it not only through investments and through making sure Google's tools are available and, and accessible to people here, but also through training software developers and entrepreneurs in how to build businesses online with mobile and web applications so that it can create jobs. I do this because I'm not a doctor. I don't know how to save lives or build hospitals. I'm an entrepreneur and a technologist. And so I do what I know. And by doing what you know, I believe you can get over the paralysis that comes when you don't know what to do to make a difference. Am I going to bring peace between Israel and Palestine? No. Is mine going to be a movement like Oscar's? Probably not. Am I going to impact a few people's lives? Yes, in a dramatic way. Thank you.